Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the serious strategy gamer and I'm officially in lockdown due to the coronavirus and that means I have a little bit more time to play games. Now, I wanted to take the chance and play something that I haven't played on this channel yet uh, and wanted to show you guys a new game, Twilight Struggle. Now, Twilight Struggle is an adaption of a board game uh, which is consistently ranked as one of the best board games of all times on BoardGameGeek.com. So I think this is a very nice game. It does fall into our sweet spot. It's a strategy game. It's about the Cold War from 1945 till 1989. So this is a game where you're playing either the Soviets or the US side and you're vying for control of the world uh, via nefarious uh, deeds and so on. So let's uh, have a look at this and I'm going to talk about how the game works in a little bit of an offline game over here just so we have time to explain what's going on. Uh, let's create a game over here. We're going to play the Soviets because I think it's the slightly more interesting uh, side to play although the uh, US is also extremely interesting. Um, and if there's interest on the channel by you guys, um, I'm going to play the US at a later time. So let's jump right in and I'm going to explain what it's all about. Now, as you can see, it's an adaption of a board game. We do have different cards that we're going to be able to play. Now, the goal of the game is basically to score points. You score points um, by basically controlling countries around the world and how we can control countries more on that later and um, the scoring system with the points is slightly different in that normally um, so let's say the USSR scores three points uh, the scoring counter would move three points towards the USSR if the US then scores a point it would go down to two points in favor of the USSR so it's a, it's a sort of a net scoring system uh, once any side has 20 points the game is over and that side wins uh, on the other hand, if the end of the game comes along, uh, the side who has the most points win. Now these are only two win conditions, there are other ones, uh, but they's, they are a little bit um, more esoteric. We're going to talk about them though in a second. Now you can see there are various different countries on the map in various different regions. So we've got Europe over here, which includes Canada, and uh, we've got Central America, South America, Africa, Middle East Asia and Southeast Asia. Now we're going to play a couple of our cards as time goes by uh, and during that time uh, oh you know what I actually forgot to start my timer so let's go ahead and do that right so um, while we go uh, we'll be playing uh, we will be playing um, placing influence in various countries you can see there is currently one US influence so it's on the left side this blue counter in Israel and one USSR influence in Iraq they can be influenced by both nations in the same country doesn't matter the important thing is as soon as the difference in influence is equal or larger to the stability which is denoted here in the upper right corner that country is uh, considered to be controlled by one of the factions so you can see right now East Germany here is uh, has three USSR influence three communist influence since it does have a stability of three that means it's currently controlled by the USSR if the US um, if the Western side uh, placed one influence into here it would not be controlled by us anymore because the difference isn't large enough you can see uh, vice versa UK stability of five is currently controlled by the uh, by the Western side by the Americans so the game usually starts uh, it will be placed in various different rounds so we have ten rounds and each round is uh, made up of uh, a couple of different well action rounds no, sorry it's six action rounds and it's ten turns so ten turns each uh, composed of between six and eight action uh, rounds so before that though there is one initial setup period and in that per period we can place six influence so we can place six influence in whichever country we may please now this is only countries that we are d either do have a direct connection to from the USSR so we could place something Oh no, I think initially it's only in Europe actually, so yeah. But however, normally you can only play place influence in adjacent countries. So we're going to place three influence in Poland, so we control that country now. And we have three more influence to place. We'll place one in East Germany, another one in Poland I want to say, and we're going to place one in Yugoslavia. Now there's a difference here between some of these countries. You can see some of them are highlighted in red, and that means these are battle count, battleground countries. They are considered extremely important by the game. The other ones are slightly less so. And the reason for that is we are going to play these cards later on. Do give me a second on that. 
But every now and then a scoring card comes into play. So a scoring card might be uh, for or is usually for a specific region. So let's say Europe. There's a Europe scoring card, and if you play the European scoring card, you will get uh, points dependent on the allocation of countries in Europe. You can see basically it's one point per controlled battleground country in the region. Currently we control Eastern Germany and Poland, so we would be getting two points. You also get points for having a presence in the region, so just having a single controlled country in the region. The western side does have that because they are controlling uh, the UK. We do have that because we are obviously controlling something as well. So they would be getting three points for presence, we are getting that as well. We'd be getting two points from Battleground, we get five points, they get three points, and that is a net movement of two points per region. Now there's not only presence, but also domination or control. If you get domination, that is if you have more controlled Battleground countries than the other side, and at least one non-Battleground, and you have more countries controlled in total, then you are considered dominating, and that does uh, move you up from presence to domination. So that would be pretty good, but it's a pretty harsh condition. You can also get to uh, control, so that is if you're controlling all the battlegrounds, and I think at least one non-battleground, you'd be considered controlling, and in the case of Europe that would automatically win you the game, so that's another way to end the game. In other countries or in other regions, that is simply more points. So. Without further ado, uh, let's commit to this decision over here. The uh, western side is moving its things as well, and we're getting into the headline text. So you can see the western side has um, moved points into West Germany and Italy. That is pretty typical for them, uh, and one of the reasons for that is if you control a country, it gets much harder for another for the other side to place influence into that region. So. In this case, uh, we'd be having a hard time placing any influence into West Germany, and that means we have a much harder time to break into the rest of Western Europe, and the same here with Italy. Also, these are two battleground countries. So this is a pretty standard opening here for everyone. Um, you can also see we have overprotected, so to say, some of these countries, as have uh, the Americans here in the case of Italy. Now, let's get actually into the game, since we've done the setup. So, we have, oh, this is a space marker, we're going to talk about that at some point as well. And um, we have six action rounds in total and a headline phase. So we will be placing a couple of cards in our headline phase, uh, sorry, in our action rounds. Uh, and the way that works is typically the Soviet player moves first and then the Americans move second. That does give the Soviets quite a bit of an advantage because they sort of control the pacing of the game. Whereas, especially early on, the US is a lot more reactive. But I think that's great, just for the first game to see how things will be going. Now before we get into these six action rounds, we get into headline phase, and that is we can pick one of our cards to be the so-called headline. And the headline is basically it will trigger the event associated uh, with these cards. Now let's look at one of these cards. Uh, we can for example look at No Rod. You can see a card is composed of two things. There's the event and there is the point value over here. So this is a three point card. Whenever we play that in the next round, uh, we could do use three things for various different purposes, uh, which we're going to see in a second, and that would be fine. We could also play it for the event and that is um, marked down here. However, you might notice there are different types of cards. So there are cards that are marked in white, there are cards that are marked in red, and there are cards that are marked in both things. Now, red things are cards that are for us. So, Vietnam Revolt is a communist event. That means that is an event that is good for us. We will be placing two influence into Vietnam, down here. For the remainder of the turn, the Soviet player may, play, may add one operations point to any card that uses points in Southeast Asia, so in this region down here. Now that's pretty good because that is one event for us, whereas on the other hand, CIA created is an event that is bad for us. It's good for the American side. USSR reveals it, it hands its hand to the uh, American player. So we'd be showing all things and the American player would be able to conduct an action card. So that's not good for us. That's an American action. Now later on, when we will be playing our cards, um, 
whenever we play a card for its value, let's say this one for the three value over here, and it's an enemy card, it will automatically trigger that event as well. So, honestly, our card deck here isn't specifically very good because it does involve a lot of American cards. We do not be having a lot of cards that we can play for the point value ourselves. Only Vietnam revol revolts, India-Pakistani war, Olympic games, all the China cards are cards that we can play ourselves. So, that's not necessarily very good. Specifically, there's only really one event here that is only good for us, and that is Vietnam Revolts. We could also headline, so use the event in the very first round, India-Pakistani War. Now that's not necessarily good, because this card would replace all of the influence of the enemy player in either India or Pakistan if we are successful on a die roll. Now, since the Americans don't have any influence in either Pakistan or India, that's pretty worthless to us. We could also headline Olympic Games. This is a little bit of a weird one. Um, honestly, I don't think it's that important for us. We could gain two victory points, but yeah, I don't think that's really useful. On the other hand, Vietnam Revolts is actually super useful. And one of the reasons for that is we would be able not only to get influence into Vietnam, but because we would have influence in Vietnam, we could easily then spread to Thailand, Laos, Malaysia, Burma. So all of these countries would be open for us. Um, and therefore I think we're gonna headline Vietnam Revolts. The enemy, um, so the Americans are heading, headlining the Marshall Plan. That means they are adding one influence in each of seven USSR non-USSR controlled countries in Western Europe. So they'll be getting a lot of influence here. That's not necessarily great for us. They'll be placing that momentarily. Yeah, you can see they're placing that in Canada, Spain, Portugal, UK, Italy. Italy is overprotected now dramatically. So that's not great for us. We need to see how we can react to that. On the other hand, we have gained some points now here in Vietnam. So all of that is great. And um, let's get into the actual first action round. So action round one, it's the USSR turn. We can now place something somewhere on the map. We can use our cards. Now again, a lot of our cards are not necessarily that great for us. Um, a lot of these cards are actually for the US. For example, you can see Norad. If the US controls Canada, the US may add one influence to any country already containing US influence. That's obviously not good. We could resolve that event and then do either of three things. And these are at the core of the game. We could place influence, so this is a three point card, so that would mean we can place three influence anywhere on the map. That is adjacent to a country that we control. So you can see we'd not be able to place anything in South America, uh, Central America, Africa really, because we've no presence absolutely here at all. We could be placing a lot of things in the Middle East, in Europe, or in Asia. Specifically, since we are now controlling Vietnam, we can place uh, influence around here, so that's pretty good. We can also um, use realignment roles. They are a little bit weird, or coup attempts. Now, coup attempts are something that is very crucial. Coup attempts mean you basically try to take over a country. And you can do that specifically with countries that have a very low stability. Um, or you can, well, mostly. So the way that that works is, um, let's actually go ahead and, and just um, do that. Could pick East on European unrest. So that would remove US USSR influence from three countries in Eastern Europe. And that might include Yugoslavia, which would not be great. But let's go ahead and do that. So we could either place influence, three influence, we could place that anywhere basically. Now that's not necessarily great because I don't think that's really required and we need to talk about the DEFCON marker now. So the DEFCON marker here means there is basically um, the question of whether we are at peace or nuclear war. Whenever anyone triggers the move from DEFCON 2 to DEFCON 1, so nuclear war, he loses immediately the game. So nuclear war is a lost game immediately at that very second for you. Now the further you move to the right, the more restricted coups and realignment attempts will be. So whenever you do decrease DEFCON, you're also limiting the options uh, of what's going to happen on the map. Now, specifically, you can see that once we are at DEFCON 4, there can be no coups or realignment attempts in Europe. Now, what would 
what would um, what brings DEFCON 2 degrees? There are a couple of things. The most important is if you are cooing, if you are using this for a coup attempt in a battleground country, so in one of the red ones, you will immediately uh, reduce DEFCON by one level. So that might be a pretty good thing for us actually. So I'm considering whether that is something that we should do. Now the way that this works is if we do a coup attempt, say with Olympic Games here, we could do that anywhere, right? So we could try to do that in Portugal, uh, we could try to do that in Canada or wherever. Now if we do it in a battleground country, so in one of the red ones, it would decrease DEFCON and that would mean they cannot do that in Europe anymore. The US moves uh, second, USSR moves first, so that is one of the key advantages. Now I'm a little bit skeptical. A good target usually early on is Iran. Iran only has two stability, so that'd be a good target. Uh, Israel, four stability, that's not a good target. We can see that over here. So basically, we have used a two tire card over here, so total operations value two. Then you take the stability of the country times two, so there's a defense, coup defense of four, and we make a die roll. If our die roll is our die roll get basically gets two points get deducted, so four minus two from our die roll, and that many amounts of points will be swung from their side to ours. Now that sounds a little bit complicated. It isn't really. It basically means the higher the va operations value, the better your chances will be, and the lower the stability, the better your chances will be. In this case, we basically have a malice of two. And that means if we are rolling a one, nothing happens. If we are rolling a two, nothing happens. If we are rolling a three, we'd be removing the US, uh, the US influence. If we are do uh, rolling a four, we'd be getting a swing of two. So basically, it would give us one influence. And if we are rolling above that, we'd be getting control of that country. So that's pretty fantastic, uh, but it's not necessarily what we want to do. You can also see in Israel, defense value here is, f uh, or stability is four, that gives us a uh, coup defense of eight so there's a basically um, a, a malice of six and that basically means we cannot ever change uh, the stability here with the total operations value of two if we are picking a higher value card we'd be having a chance to do something but it would be a pretty bad chance now I'm specifically eyeing Italy because Italy is a battleground state and as soon as DEFCON gets reduced uh, we'd probably not be able to do anything over here now with this card, we can't necessarily do much. So what if instead we'd be using this one over here? Now, we would be having a sort of a 50-50 chance of breaking their control of Italy, which would be nice, and even a one in six chance of increasing our own. If we're picking the China card, so even higher value, um, we might be shifting that we have about a, a two and third chance to break their control and about a one and third chance to actually get uh, influence ourselves and maybe even get control if we are very lucky and roll a six. Now, that is nice, but it's not necessarily the best thing that we can do, I believe. So what instead we're gonna do, containment, what does that mean? Oh yeah, so containment is an interesting card. It's a US card, so if we were use if we were to use that for a coup attempt, it would mean all further cards by the US player would um, be one better than they are now. Now obviously that is not something that we want to do, uh, but it's only applicable to this turn. So we might want to play that card as sort of the last card in this turn. So at, in action round six of turn one, might be a good idea to play it then. Uh, but we're not going to open with that, certainly. Now, I'm thinking Norod will come into play sooner or later. Now, it's not great because they might control Canada, but still, I think it would be a good chance here to do a coup attempt against Italy. It's sort of a 50-50 thing, let's try. Yeah, and we are failing extremely hard. That's that's unfortunate. So we are not getting a good card deck to begin with, and we are having bad luck as well. And there you go, opponent e event is triggered. And there's a little notification now that Norod is in play. Not good. Definitely not good for us. And now it's the US player's turn to decide. We haven't really made any impression here at all. Not good. Absolutely not good for us. 
Now, I'm thinking that the US player will probably decide on a coup as well. No, he's actually placing influence. Now, that's also interesting. He's placing four influence. And he has placed some influence into South Korea and some into Pakistan. Now, that's a very interesting play because to me, this might indicate that he has potentially the Asia scoring card. He has placed all of his influence into Asia and he might try to boost up his presence. Now, at the moment, he has two battleground and one non-battleground, whereas, whereas I only have one battleground state, North Korea. He does have South Korea and Pakistan. So that means he is now in a domination position. And of course, he has two battlegrounds, so that's nine points. Uh, whereas it, we only have a presence and a single battleground, only four points. This scoring would be super great for him. I don't think that is necessarily something that I want. Now, we have a couple of ways to react to that. Now, one way would be to try to break his control here of South Korea. The issue is, if we're placing one influence into here, so firstly, cooing this as a level three, this is going to be extremely hard. Usually it's worthwhile to coup stuff um, at level two, and level two is pretty decent to coup. So we could try to coup Pakistan. And if we were to use, um, let's say, a level two card on that, we'd be having, um, well, a relatively okay chance to, to break his control. Um, not really a good chance to take over control though, so I'm not sure that it would be the best play over here. We can also just straight out place influence. We are adjacent to Thailand and that is a very good chance to, to do something about that. On the other hand, we also have the India-Pakistani war card. So we can choose whether India or Pakistan invades the other, roll one die and subtract for one point for every opponent controlled country adjacent to the target of the invasion. On a modified roll of four to six, player wins, otherwise the other side wins. If we are winning, we gain two victory points. We get, we'd be getting a couple of military operations, more on that later, um, and we'd be replacing all opponents' influence with target countries. So let's look at that. How many opponent-controlled countries do, does he have adjacent to Pakistan? Well, none. He's not controlling pa Afghanistan. He has influence in Iran, but he's not controlling it. Um, and he doesn't have any presence in India. So basically, this means with a 50-50 chance, we would be able to take over Pakistan. And honestly, does that even reduce DEFCON? I don't think it does. That might be very nice. On the other hand, if it doesn't reduce DEFCON, he could just coup Pakistan as well. If we are winning, that is. Well, 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 what is it that we want then? We also have Eastern European unrest, and we could do a coup attempt on Pakistan as well. That would actually give us a decent chance of winning over here. So you know what? I think this is a good play. This means we have a decent chance. Yes, and indeed we roll a six. So total operation value of three, coup defense four, six. That means this is a minus one. So that's a five point swing from two points in their favor to three points in our favor. Reducing DEFCON because uh, Pakistan is a battleground state and there's a certain benefit to that. On the other hand, it does trigger the opponent event and he can now remove three influence from Russia uh, or the Soviets in these countries. He's reducing that in Yugoslavia, which is not a big surprise, but pretty bad for us still. Now, let's look at the uh, controlling here in Asia. Now, we have two battlegrounds, whereas he has only one, only South Korea. That means we are now in a domination position and it's now a five point uh, scoring in our favor. Let's see what he does. He's trying to do a coup. He cannot coup in Asia. He must be trying to do that in the Middle East. And that's interesting to see. Now we are at DEFCON 2. That means if anyone was to reduce DEFCON further, we'd be having problems. We'd be entering nuclear war and whoever did that would uh, lose the game. Now. Usually that is not something that you do by um, by design, but let's remember cards like CIA created. If we were to play that, then the US may conduct an operations card as if they played a one-off card, and they may just try to do a coup during our own. 
uh, during our action phase and that would mean we would lose the game so this is a card we may absolutely not play this turn so that is something to consider now we want to we still suspect that he might either have um, the Asia scoring card or the Middle East scoring card. Now during the early war period, so during the first three rounds, uh, there are only three uh, action cards in play, uh, sorry, three scoring cards. Europe, Middle East and Asia. And Africa, South America, Central America, Southeast Asia, all of these get added later on. So we might as well concentrate <coughs> excuse me, on these three regions, Middle East, Asia, and Europe. Now, since we cannot do any, any scoring or anything, um, I'm tempted to expand our presence here in Asia and make it just much more difficult for the Americans to keep control of that. We currently have control of North Korea, Pakistan, and Vietnam, whereas he only has South Korea and I think Australia, yeah. So, on the other hand, we also have this point, so any scoring um, any point that uses all points in Southeast Asia, we may add one operations. Additionally, China has plus one operations value when all points are used in Asia. Now, the China card is a little bit different because it always starts in the USSR, USSR hand and it will change hands every time. So when we play that, it will get over to, uh, will be passed over to the US and the US will be able to use it next turn but I think that's okay we are gonna place that now and we're gonna use that to place influence because we can't really do any coups and space race is something that we're gonna talk about later and we can place four points because it's the China card if we place them over here and um, you can see basically it would add points because well it's the China card all of this is in Asia and we have the Southeast Asia topic so if we do place them all over here we'd be getting a lot of points. Um, if we are breaking out of Southeast Asia, we'd be getting less points, um, but as long as we stay in China, we can still, uh, sorry, in Asia, we can still place a lot of points. And I'm thinking that we might want to score India here as well. So that means we can only place a couple of things, but we now control a lot of uh, battleground states. Four battleground states in the region the US only has South Korea um, it might get Japan it's pretty likely to get Japan at some point um, but with these three in our hands I'd be pre feeling pretty happy honestly about this so yeah we are gonna commit to this decision and gonna pass it on over here see what the US is doing how many more roads do we uh, extra ones do we have so we can place three more cards we already decided that CIA created is not a good one uh, to play for us Influence by his only two influence though Could, should be too much Lebanon and Portugal now. That's interesting. Why would he score Lebanon? And why would he be placing that in Portugal? Interesting choices now again, we need to place place three more cards CAA created is not going to be one of them uh, Containment is a good card to play uh, at the last point because it would increase his subsequent um, Scoring points so that means basically we can pick between these guys over here um, these two would be neutral. I don't think India-Pakistani war is that valuable for us right now as an event because we are controlling both of these um, states effectively. So we don't actually need to con need to do anything in that regard over here. So I think that's actually pretty fine. We can play that. Olympic Games also a card where I think the event is a little bit eh. It's not really that, that useful. So um, that is also a card that we can easily use for influence. For most of resolution is means Thailand would uh, Taiwan would be treated as a battleground state for scoring purposes for the US. So basically, if the um, Asia scoring card came up, he would be adding a single battleground state if he controlled Taiwan. Now he doesn't control Taiwan, and honestly, he would be having two battlegrounds. We still have four, so yeah, that's not really that critical for us right now, um, and I think that's that's all right. So we can basically play all of them. Um, sort of irrelevantly which one. Um, I think we're going to start with this one, we're going to place some influence um, and I think we're going to take over Iraq over here and make sure um, that we are in, in a dominant position in Iraq. Now we have more battleground states than he has 
uh, but we don't have more uh, countries overall and we don't have a non-battleground so we are still considered to be only present and not uh, dominant in the Middle East. So let's see what he does and how he reacts to that. I think he might shore up Iran, he might um, improve Israeli defenses. We'll have to see. I'm slightly worried about Europe because he is extremely strong in Western Europe and uh, Western Germany and Italy. He'll be able to control France at some point. Oh, now he has been forced to, place, uh, to play a card that is um, a red card. So whether he's been forced or whether he just decided to do that, I don't know. But it does mean there's an event for us. And the event is that we can remove a total of four US influence from France, there's none, the UK and Israel. So that's nice, but no more than two per country. So we can remove four. And basically it's only these two countries that have any. So we're going to remove one from Israel, we're going to remove two from the UK and that's actually all that we can do, so that's fine. But that it means he has no presence anymore in Israel and uh, he doesn't actually control the UK, which is actually very nice. He, however, can now place three influence and um, so basically net, net thing is he'll probably reinforce the UK now. Don't think he will be placing anything in Israel, but we have to see. Probably UK, Iran, maybe Canada. Oh, interesting. So that went to Angola, Panama, and Iran. Interesting, interesting, interesting. All right. So I'm pretty, pretty, feeling pretty confident about Asia. I didn't think we need to react in Asia. Um, I would, however, like to expand our presence here in the Middle East somewhat. And uh, we're going to play the Formosan re Resolution for that, um, for influence actually. And we're going to be placing one influence into Syria. So we now control a battleground and a non-battleground over here. Still not more than he has and it's actually the same in terms of battleground. So that's actually fairly nice. And we could place further points anywhere. I don't think we might actually start to place a point in Israel over here because it would be very nice to get that. It would mean we are sort of itching slowly towards North America, uh, sorry, North, North Africa. And that's actually not that bad. And if we can lock him out over here, that'd be fantastic too. Plus, uh, due to its high stability, Israel is pretty, pretty immune to any coup attempts. So that's nice. Well, not technically immune, but in actuality, it's, it's a minus eight modifier. So even if you're placing a four card there, and that'd be that'd be pretty harsh. Now, space race. One of the things that you can do with a card, especially with a card that you don't want to play, is you can send it to space. And what happens then is you have this space race marker over here, and you basically have a roll. So you need to place a card that is at least two value, and what will happen is on a roll of one to three, you were successful in that, you will advance one point. On a roll to one to four, you'll advance one point and so on and so forth. And you'd be getting different advantages that are listed down here. Currently, he is getting two victory points. And if we are the second one to score the H-bomb, we'd be only getting one victory point. So that means he is now at two victory points, which is not necessarily ideal for us. But yeah, what can we do? Only one more round. So I think this is a perfect point to place actually containment over here. It means he will be getting more points in the future with the next move, um, but maybe he doesn't have a next move. Maybe he has a scoring card and you actually need to place scoring cards uh, before the end of the turn. So that might be what he's doing. Um, that being said, we're gonna use that to place influence and I think we're gonna place all of that in Israel. So that means uh, he has now a harder time to break through over here. And we are now actually in a in a domination position because we are controlling two battlegrounds, Iraq and Israel, and non-battleground Syria, whereas he does only have control of two countries. So that's fine. Let's see what his last move is going to be. And indeed, he does have a scoring card that he does need to play now. We are getting seven victory points over here, and that is fairly fantastic. So that moves us from two for the US to five for them. There's also a question about the DEFCON level. So you need to have military operations, which you gain by doing coups and items like that. He did one coup worth of two points, so he has uh, the required scoring over here. Uh, we did a little bit more, so we all succeed that, so there's no victory point effect over here. If he, for example, had not done any, any coup or whatever, uh, we'd be getting two additional victory points here. That's not that important. 
end of the turn, so DEFCON will also improve by one, and all of these temporary effects now will go away. As I said, DEFCON is improving, we are being uh, dealt new cards, and that is fine, we'll need to headline a new card over here, but you know what, uh, it's well time, I think, uh, to actually end the episode here. I think the next ones will be a little bit faster, but I did want to explain the game so that you actually know what's going on. That being said, thank you very much for watching, guys, and I hope to see you around next time. Bye-bye.